Welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of this Cataclysm, a Second World War session playthrough. We're on turn number two, that's the 1935-36 turn, and let's take a quick overview, less than less than a minute, of what has happened up to this point. If you don't feel like watching that first turn, um, we did have a civil war breakout in Spain in the first turn. We had some expansion by the fascists in Europe, specifically Rome uh, uh, got a victory cube because the Italians were able to successfully pursue their Abyssinian adventure, which is the invasion of Ethiopia down here. It's just represented by this token and this cube. The Germans were able to successfully get diplomacy in Benelux and Sweden, uh, and the Soviet Union was able to successfully get some diplomacy in the Baltic states. The uh, a Pacific situation on the map is that a lot of American and Soviet aid has been sent to the Chinese communists at this point. And the Japanese have managed some diplomatic inroads outside of those in the warlord territories. And it looks like they are on the verge of picking up that Sichuan resource without having to fight for it. So that would certainly be good for them, but they're going to need some flags in order to pull that off. Meanwhile, the actual situation on the player boards, <clears throat> you can see that Germany and Italy have both uh, upgraded to rearmament. Japan has increased to mobilization. The Soviet Union also got to rearmament. Basically, everybody managed to go up one level except for France and the United States. So that is the current situation economically and the current situation on the board. Let's jump into the turn. Uh, the other thing you can see here is that the British have a cube in the failed political action box. They were trying to pressure for the French to improve their stability. Uh, and then the French have failed three propaganda roles, so they're still sitting there and wavering. And now we will move on to following through the process. And we start with the administrative phase. And that means all the factions gain flags, except that status quo is in effect, so the allies don't get that. Germany gets, and I'm actually going to move their uh, resource that the Italians and the Germans have. It's going to get moved out of their production holding box just so that we can easily see it and don't forget about it. So the Axis all get a flag. Germany gets two. The Soviets switch to political purges on the previous turn, so that gets uh, them a flag this time. The French do not get a flag unless they want to suffer a stability test. Same with the British, thanks to status quo. Uh, I think neither of them want to do that because they're both at wavering. And, you know, even at rearmament, it's not that big a deal if you collapse, but the extra flag, especially for France, is so unlikely to be helpful. You have to uh, pass that test with a 60... Uh, no, yeah, it's a 60, 70% chance of failure and losing stability. And then if you get the flag and you get that failure, you then have a very small chance of actually increasing it. And France especially needs to keep their stability as high as possible or else it's very tempting for the Germans to just attack and try to take it over. So they're not taking their flag. The Americans don't get a flag because they're also under status quo. So we go on to production. Starting with France, France has uh, not increased to rearmament, so they only get one build this turn. And or an offensive, but the offensive is not going to be terribly useful because I don't expect uh, war to break out just now, or at least the French part of my mind does not. So they are going to spend the Dreadnought refit counter to reduce the cost of this uh, fleet from uh, two to one, and that will allow them to build it with a single build. Next is Italy. They have the same possible option here with their Dreadnought refit counter. They could refit their World War I ships to uh, up to World War II standards, but uh, they now have two resources and they're at rearmament. They have this resource that was carried over from last turn, plus they have the resource in Lombardy. They also have the Rome resource they could use whenever they want. It's a limited resource. It's only a one-time use, and that means you probably want to save it for when Italy is at war and at least at mobilization, because right now it would give them one build. If they were at war and at mobilization, it would give them two military actions and uh, two builds uh, or, you know, two sets of military actions, right? So you're going to basically quadruple the power of this resource if you hold on to it until mobilization. So we're definitely going to do that. The Italians now have to decide exactly how they're going to spend those two builds they do have. They're going to need... See, Libya is, is in danger. There's nothing there to stop the British from taking it. 
which isn't the worst thing in the world, but if you lose Libya, you have no way to grab Egypt real easily. Um, so you kind of want to get, you want to get everything out on the board, but when we're looking at this, unless you're expecting the war to break out immediately, let's get that fleet out there. Reason being, uh, the fleet takes two turns to build. Uh, so actually I'm putting that on the turn track right now. And so, so the French also needs to go on the turn track. Um, so you might as well use that. And then the Italians get one more build, and I think it's going to be an infantry army. All right, so that's the Italians. They're done. Uh, they use their, their, their build from last year, their resource from last year, and their resource they got from Lombardy. All right, next up is the Americans and the British, starting with the British. They are going to collect two resource, resources as normal. They get London and they get Canada. They do not get the Pacific resources. So what will they do with these two resources, which gives them two builds? I kind of think, like, should they use one of them? Should they use them both for this tank upgrade? It's really nice to have tanks, especially if your opponent doesn't. But the question is, are we going to send the British expeditionary force over to France? If you do, sometimes that can lead to a collapse of the UK, and that's real bad. But if you do it in their tanks, it's much less likely to happen. So yeah, the French, or the, sorry, the British are going to invest in a tank upgrade. That's their choice. Next up, the Americans. Unfortunately for the Americans, they're still shipping one resource over to Japan, which leaves them with six, which leaves them with only three that they can produce with. So mm, let's go with... Oh, and the Americans have the fleet they built from last turn in their production holding box. So they're going to spend... <sighs> Do they want to put one in Jiangsu? If they don't put one in Jiangsu... They still get, you know, credit should the uh, should the Japanese attack it. They still get a flag, but um, if they don't send aid, then Jiangsu has less dice to roll against the Japanese. I think because the Japanese appear to be using a diplomatic strategy as opposed to a military strategy, the Americans are just going to build up. They're going to use all their resources for building the stuff in their production holding box um, instead of building any offensives this turn to be used for aid. So, okay, so that's the Americans. They're done. They did three. And next we go to the Soviet Union. Soviet Union has their two main resources, the Moscow and the Caucasus. They have no limited resources and they have no other resources to collect. So because they're at rearmament, they're going to get two builds. And just looking at this, I think it's going to be a fortress for one because you got to build those early. They're useless if you get them built out late. And it's going to be an infantry army for the other. One of the things that the Soviets have that's very interesting is you really feel the need to build up a lot of infantry armies just because look how big your territorial borders are. One, two, three, just on this one border. And usually you want to stick two guys up front if you can. And then on this border, you also have four, five, six. Like there's just so many borders to guard as the Soviets, that it's problematic. you got to have a lot of armies to do it. Otherwise, you're just leaving areas open to be attacked easily. So yeah, they're going to build that fortress and the infantry army. Ah, but you know, we did build this tank upgrade for a reason. No, we need the infantry army. I liked, I'd liked get, I would like to get the tanks, but you know, we're not, we're not needing them yet. So that's the Soviets are done. We go to the Japanese. Japanese have... Their three resources, right? They have their American resource, their main resource, and their Manchurian resource. And they are at mobilization, so that those three actually convert to six builds or four builds plus an offensive. And I think they're definitely going to take an offensive. Um, uh, you know what? No. They're going to use these wisely. They're going to build an air upgrade, a fortress... So that's one, two, three. A logistics marker is four. Hmm. No, the fortress goes on the turn tracks. So let's do that. So the air upgrade is two. Two fortresses gets us to four. And they got two more. Should it be a carrier upgrade? Signs point to yes. Or it could be 
this air unit and this logistics unit. I think it's going to be the carrier upgrade. Okay, so that's all six that Japan gets to build with. That's actually a lot, right? Even though they have so few resources, jumping to mobilization is huge. It's huge. And the reason that Japan didn't pick the offensive is because have, they right now have a pretty significant advantage over the United States, their primary enemy, because they're building six things a turn. And the Americans built, what, uh, three things, even though they have twice as many resources. So that's that's really good for Japan. And this way, next turn, Japan will take a lot of offensives and start using those uh, at that point. But until that status quo goes away, Japan has to bide its time. If Japan is too aggressive, it really hurts the fascist chance of victory. Unless, as we mentioned earlier, in the first turn, or the first, uh, first turn video, the Axis are pursuing a short war strategy. And right now, there hasn't been a lot of opportunity for that to come up. Usually a short war strategy starts getting executed around 1937. So we'll see if there's an opportunity for that as the fascists. Moving on, the Germans now have their chance, and look, they have a massive force pool. They are, they could consider the fleet for the same reasons as all the others, but unless they're actually planning to utilize it, it's probably a mistake. Meanwhile, they absolutely want to use this upgrade. Oh, we need, we need to check how many resources they have. They have one from last turn, and they have two more inside Germany proper. They could also collect the Benelux resource, though that seems like it would be a waste. Even the Sweden resource is only uh, a regular natural resource. It's not like the Ruhr or the Benelux resources, which are the ones that are twice as effective when you're at war. But I think, you know, they're going to play it a little safe. There's no reason to grab the Swedish resource yet. They have an easy time holding on to Sweden with their flags. Benelux is probably the same way. They're probably going to garrison it this turn. And speaking of that, here's what they can do. Uh, so they've got three resources and therefore three builds. One, two, uh, three, right? You've got to have an extra army there because if you don't, then the French, and this has happened in some games, can get uppity and they might say, hey, Germany's kind of weak right now. Uh, why don't we get this thing started? Because maybe status quo breaks due to the French losing a bunch of victory points. I mean, that stuff can happen. You've got to be prepared for those possibilities. So that's the three German resources. The Ruhr resource, the Berlin resource, and, uh, and this resource from the previous turn. They're not going to do any real attacking because they don't want to build up flags for the Allies just yet. If the French lose a bunch of cubes over here in Eastern Europe, that changes the equation. But right now, they haven't lost any of those cubes from the uh, crisis events. All right, so that's the last of that. Then, then, then we go to the final disposition. Uh, per the ruling from Scott, we go in uh, increasing effectiveness order again. The French are going to choose to reserve their, uh, their fortress, I think. You know, I always want to try to make it work by putting it in Lorraine. Like, hey, there's got to be a reason that they did that. But no, it always works better if you put it in Paris. Uh, it just does. All right. And then they uh, will put their flag into the available. Then we go to the Italians. The Italians have two things. They're definitely going to put Il Duce into the, uh, the slot here, the reserve. Then we go to... The Americans and the British. The Americans are going to reserve nothing. They don't really care. Actually, you know, they got to reserve something. Even if you don't care when these things come out, you still want them to come out sooner than later. Oh, but no, you know what? Yeah, you know, no, they're not going to reserve anything. They're, they're years away from war, so they don't care. And they'd rather leave the slot open to maybe put a, a flag there if they absolutely need to. All right, so that's the Americans. The British are definitely going to reserve their tank upgrade because they'd like to get that out as soon as possible, just in case. Then the, ja the Soviets, rather, are going to reserve a flag. Oh, you know what? The, we didn't unflip all of these commitment markers from last turn. we got to remember which powers have uh, increased their commitment in a given turn. So that's fixed. Um, now the Soviets reserve a flag, and they put the other two in the cup. The... Japanese are 
probably going to reserve that flag. They want to spend that as soon as possible so that they can uh, make room for more flags that appear. Hopefully they get more, more flags. That's what they're hoping for. All right, that goes in the Action Cup. The Germans are going to keep... I mean, they have no designs over military action this turn, so they're going to put a flag in reserve. The worst thing that can happen is the thing that you're planning on basing your turn around. In this case, the Germans need their flag. Um, the thing you're basing your turn around, if that takes forever to come out of the cup, sometimes that can be a big problem. So the rest of that goes into the action cup, and we're ready to go. We're on to the sequence of play. And now the Germans have the first chance to use their flag. They do want to put a unit into Benelux. And so, you know what? That's exactly what they're going to do. Instead of reserving the flag, Germany is reserving the infantry army. Because that way they could... Because otherwise they would have to waste their flag on a maneuver uh, action, political action, in order to move the unit in there. But if the first thing the Germans do is construct the unit in the Ruhr and then deploy it to Benelux, suddenly they're golden. The Allies can no longer conduct diplomacy in Benelux as long as that German unit is there. So that is probably the best move for the Germans. The Germans just interrupted, so the Soviets may now interrupt, and I think they are going to uh, hold on to their flag. They, If they were to lose another flag, they'd use it, but until that point, they'd rather wait until after the Soviet uh, force um, home front comes out. So now moving on, the British are going to interrupt and send that to their force pool and flip over their infantry army to a tank army. That allows the Japanese or the Italians to interrupt. The Italians don't need stability. I don't want them to increase their commitment yet. Uh, so they're going to hold on to Il Duce. Meanwhile, the Japanese do have something to do with this flag, and they don't, they can't go to total war, because we don't even have limited war happening yet, and they can't go to total war unless either global war has happened or... Uh, they themselves are at uh, total are at, at war. So they are going to use this flag to attempt diplomacy in Sichuan, which is a straight up effectiveness check of two. Here's the dice. They got it. Good news for Japan. Really bad news if they happen to roll a uh, uh, one of those checks that uh, causes the Chinese Civil War on the crisis table. So uh, they don't want the Chinese resistance rolls to come up. Ideally, they would move their units in to these territories. They have three. They could put, they could garrison all of these to protect themselves. And that's probably what they're going to do uh, come the moment when, uh, when that home front comes up. All right, so that's the Japanese. The Soviets are still holding onto theirs. The French will interrupt and put out their fortress in Paris. Because they can see the writing on the wall. If Benelux would, was held by the British, which the British could try to do in some games if they spend their flags that way, then the French could put their fortress in Lorraine, Maginot Line style, and it would be okay. Because the Germans would have a much harder time going through Benelux if the British can send their air forces in to aid it. Um, so even if Benelux is completely neutral, Germany could have a, a time of their lives just going through there. Anyway, that's... The end of the French. These two guys are saving there, so we pull from the cup. It's a German flag. And Germany might reserve this flag, or they could attempt an alliance with Italy. They both have full stability. The alliance would provoke three enemies, which would be bad. But it would get rid of stress affront, which would allow the Germans to attempt to get Czechoslovakia and Hungary and Romania, which could make a big difference. I think they're just going to hold on to this flag and use that as an option in the future, but what they're hoping for is a bunch of these cubes to disappear from crisis events, and that's actually more likely... That, that ha seems to happen in a bunch of games. There's a lot of crisis events that could have that happen, so they're just holding on to theirs. Next out of the cup is an American air unit. Let's put that in Washington. They've already got uh, one on California. Um, all right, next out of the cup. Hey, there's the German armor. Uh, they're going to flip over Benelux and send that back to the force pool. Next out of the cup is a British home front. The British home front check is at a plus zero. Two dice. Oh, they failed. They did not fail so badly that they uh, are now um, collapsing. If they had been at mobilization, that would have been a collapse, but lucky for them, 
they are only going down to unstable. Still very worrying for the British. They're going to need some flags spent on uh, propaganda to fix that issue. Uh, Meanwhile, uh, the other thing that they can do on that home front check is move some units around. I think right now they're definitely happy with things the way that they are. The unit in Gibraltar allows them to deal with subs that are out here. The unit in the Mediterranean lets them fight the Italians if they want. And leaving the air unit in London allows them to cover Paris should it need it. All right, so moving on. the uh, Here we go. We get a Japanese... Uh, oh, I can't put it there because we already have a couple of units there. So this has to go in Korea, Japanese fleet. Next out of the cup, a Soviet infantry army. Well, the Soviets are looking at this, and right now there's no obvious place for the Soviets to get victory points. And the Germans obviously don't seem to be going this way. And that's one of the things. In many games, an East-first strategy can look kind of tempting. But man, it looks like it would be very difficult for the Germans to do without the resources in Paris and Provence, unless you do it real early. So I guess the the, the thing there is Germany could look for an opportunity for an East-first collapse the Soviet Union as fast as possible strategy if the Soviet Union misses a lot of their uh, rearmament uh, commitment roles. And they take a long time to get up to mobilization. That's when Germany might say, hey, forget the Paris resource. Leave status quo in play. I don't care about that. Let me go after the Soviet Union. Um, And if those French uh, cubes go away in Poland and Czechoslovakia and Romania, that makes it even more tempting. Because then that means the British and French can't get flags to declare war on you uh, easily. So in this case, though, the Soviet Union is going to put an infantry army here, if only because it means if Germany gets really bogged down in France, the Soviets might declare and just attack East Prussia to pick up a free flag and a victory point. And even though that makes them at war with the Germans, if the Germans are out of uh, position, that could be valuable. So having a unit in Baltic states like that gives them that opportunity in the future. Next out of the cup is a Soviet flag that they have to use right now. So the Soviet flag, they diplomacy, everything, everything political is at a minus one and they want to get up to mobilization that will actually cancel status quo. And thinking about this, I always thought that is kind of a good thing for the Soviets, but this early in the game, I mean, you don't want the British and the French to just overwhelm Germany. That would be, that's too, that's bad for you because at the end of the game, the democracies, if they get started earlier than normal, they are going to outproduce you, no question. You can't win against the democracies. You need Germany and Italy and Japan messing with the democracies so that you have a chance to win at the end. So I would love to go to mobilization right now, but I think rather than break status quo, the Soviet Union is going to keep the allies locked in that for at least one more turn. So what does that mean vis-a-vis what they're actually doing with this political action? They could conduct maneuvers and send some aid to Spain in hopes of getting a free victory point and resource there. Uh, They could do diplomacy. They can't do an alliance. They could pressure somebody. No, they want to use this for themselves. They're already at full stability. I think they're going to attempt maneuvers. Let's see. 2d6 fails. So they do get a cube on their maneuvers track. All right. So that flag failed. Next up, a German flag. They got to spend it here, but how do they spend it? They can't put cubes, they can't do diplomacy in Czechoslovakia, as tempting as that is because of stress affront. Uh, They could attempt the alliance with Italy right now, and that might be the way, but I think instead they're going to do diplomacy on Denmark. Diplomacy on Denmark does give a flag to the Allies which is a damn shame. Maybe that, you know what? I think the Germans are going to use this to pressure Japan. Right? I mean, they could pressure Italy too. Japan actually needs the flag because its stability is low and Germany has a high chance of this pressure succeeding. So here we go. Pressure Japan, success. So Germany uses its flag to send a flag to Japan, which Japan puts into reserve. Uh, And next out of the cup, 
It's a, Jer a Japanese fleet upgrade. They've got new now two carrier fleets in Tokyo, and that goes back to their force pool. And they can't interrupt, even though they would like to. So next we go to an Italian army. Now, if the Italians want to help in France, we could put this army in Lombardy, and or they could attack into Yugoslavia. Again, we'd love to wait in the hopes that these cubes go away. So part of the fascist game is try and restrain yourself because the sooner the allies get going, the worse it is for you in the long run. A new fleet comes out, and I think the Americans are going to put that in California. Can't, uh, they, they can't put another one in Hawaii because they've already got two fleets there. They can't put it in the Philippines thanks to the Washington Naval Treaty, so none of these bases can have anything. All right, next up, that was an American fleet, so the Japanese are going to interrupt, and they're going to attempt to provide uh, propaganda for their wavering stability here. 2d6 is a success, so their stability goes up by one. Good job, Japan. Next is the German home front. Germany now has to pass a standard home front test at zero. That is a success. So we put that down here. And now we have to decide if we're going to do any moving around. No, I think we're pretty much where we want to be. There's only a few units to move, and they're all where they need to be. So next up, we go to the cup again, and it's a Japanese... Uh, air upgrade. Well, there's only one air unit, so the Japanese are definitely going to upgrade that to its strategic side. That's not necessary to invade China with. Just any aircraft at all will help you in China. But the fact that we got it done early means that we can use that air upgrade for other air units that come out later in the game. If all of Jap Japan's air units are upgraded, they can place them all at these bases up here or out in the sea zones and block American lines of communication to the Philippines, which can be very valuable, or to bases. If the Americans just overstretch and like take over the Western Caroline Islands without securing their, their, their flanks here, Jap Japan can deploy all their units to block those lines of communication and then attack the Western Caroline Islands when they are out of... Uh, out of communication. So, next out of the cup is the Italian home front. The Italians are also at rearmament, so they do have to suffer a test here. It's a 1d6, and they fail. So Italy loses a little bit of stability. That's a good reason to have kept El Duce there, and that's, I think, what we're going to do right now is... Oh, they can't interrupt. That's right. Italy can't interrupt after a home front that was theirs because they get the deployment, so they don't get to interrupt. So never mind. We'll move on to the next part of the cup here, and it's a Soviet home front. This is also a 2D, this is a 2d6 roll. Five or better is a failure. So the Soviets lose some stability. Bad news for them. Do they need to maneuver anything? No, I think they're happy with things the way they are right now. They're deployed where they need to be. The Italians interrupt with Il Duce because they want to increase their stability again. Italy and France are particularly <laughs> susceptible. They need to make sure their stability track is good. So 2d6 thanks to Il Duce is a success. And their stability goes back up. All right, next out of the cup, we had the German home front, right? Yeah, the Germans might do something with their other flag here in a second. But an American army, there's already one in California. Let's, uh, you know what? California lets you do everything, though. Uh, let's keep all the infantry in California. It can move to Washington whenever, uh, if I'm remembering my rules right. Yeah, just check the... Um, Placing all your units in California is probably the smart strategy for the United States just because if they're in California, they can go to either map. It doesn't matter. If they're in Washington and they go to California, technically they have to be placed in the delay box, which stops their movement. They can't then go straight out to one of the bases, for example, or to the Philippines. Um, and the main reason for that is just to represent the fact that if you're redeploying from Europe to the Pacific or the Pacific to Europe, it shouldn't be as fast as, oh, it's, uh, boom, it's done. It should take a little bit longer. Um, and so they put a delay box in one of the two American countries. But in reality, if you're on either side of the American continent, then you can deploy to either side. So that makes sense. Uh, them thematically. Okay, so the Germans could interrupt with their flag. They don't need to do stability. The Japanese did get their stability up. Does Japan want to do anything else at the moment? The Chinese Civil War is active, so I do not believe that you can pursue any uh, diplomacy inside of uh, Chinese army areas. So yeah, they're not allowed to conduct diplomacy in these areas with Chinese armies because the Chinese Civil War is active. Oh, it's going to be inactive because the Soviets moved in 
on the previous turn. Uh, so if the Soviets keep their guy there, which I think they did, uh, the Chinese Civil War is going to be inactive and the Chinese will try to expand. Luckily for us, they can't expand into controlled territories. So that answers the question of what to do with this German flag. Well, it's going to pressure the Japanese again. So we're sending that to available. Pressure Japan. Again, the reason I'm not increasing German uh, to mobilization is they want to hold on to status quo for at least one more turn. And keeping the allies in this status quo really helps Japan uh, in all of the games I've played so far, Japan has been screwed because the Axis acted early in one side of the map or another. Either Japan attacks China on, like, turn one, or the Germans attack France in, like, turn two or three, and that screws Japan because now they have to race against the United States that's at mobilization in, like, 39, and that's way earlier than it's supposed to be. They also lose their... Um, if you can starve the Americans of flags as the fascists, then Japan gets to keep this U.S.-Japan trade marker for a lot longer. In a lot of the games, it's gone away on turn two or three. And right now, because Germany is being so passive, they're not increasing their commitment anymore. Italy is not increasing their commitment anymore. Uh, that allows the... Um, the you know They're not doing a lot of diplomacy that could give flags to the allies. That allows... Um, the, the Japanese to just spend their turns building things. In fact, they only really have one more turn of building uh, that they could do on, out of their force pool because they just don't have a lot of stuff in here. So anyway, um, Japan, uh, we're going to pressure Japan with Germany's flag. Here it is. It is successful. Japan gets the flag back in their reserve. They're hoping now to get Guangxi with their other cube because what that'll do is it'll prevent the Chinese armies from retreating or expanding when the Japanese attack. So that's what they're hoping to do. So let's see. Next up, uh, we're going to have uh, the cup pull here. Or do the Soviets... The Soviets decided not to increase the commitment. They are going to interrupt, however, with this flag and try to do propaganda. Now, remember, propaganda is a political action, but they're in political purges, so they have, a, they have uh, no penalty to their political actions here, uh, and they get three dice thanks to their no retreat. So they are successful. They managed to increase their stability. Okay, next out of the cup. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The Japanese would rather interrupt with this flag and perform um, diplomacy in Guangxi before the Civil War marker comes out. So they are going to do that. Here we go. 2d6 because there's no resistance. We're still looking for fives or sixes. They got it. Very good news for Japan. They have really done a number on China. Now, that could all go away if they can't garrison this stuff. Uh, so they're hoping for the Japanese uh, home front marker to come out soon. Instead, we get the American home front marker. They do not have to do any stability test on the home front because they are still at civilian commitment. And now they can move their stuff around, but they have no reason to do so. So they're done. Next out of the cup is a crisis marker. It's about damn time. We were almost done with the things in the cup, I think. This is a fast turn. 2d6... And that is a 4-1, which is a political crisis. Enemies of the state reduce the Soviet Union's effectiveness by one until the end of the turn. Reroll if already in effect. So the Soviet Union is now rolling one die for their effectiveness checks instead of two until the end of the turn. Bad luck for them. Next, we get another crisis. Two in a row, ladies and gentlemen. And it's a 6-4. That's a Scandinavian league. Powers of the Cuban and ungarrison Denmark, Finland, Norway, or Sweden must perform an effectiveness check for each. The only situation there is Germany in Sweden. If they fail, they remove the cube. Here's the effectiveness check. They passed. They get to keep the cube. Good news for Germany. Next out of the cup is the Japanese home front. That is what they have been hoping for. And that is going to cause a stability check here, home front stability check. Uh, and it started with mobilization, so it's actually at minus two. So sixes only are successful. Or minus one, I'm sorry. <laughs> minus one, which means they lose one level of stability. If it had been uh, a total war, they would have lost two levels of stability there. Okay, now that home front lets them deploy all their units. They're definitely going to be doing this. They do not want to lose access to that Sichuan resource, even though they might not use it next turn. It might be they want to use, I mean, because they're just so starved for resources, Japan might really want to use all those limited resources at the same time on the turn after they go to total war. It seems like the only way they can possibly win against the Americans, or at least do even remotely like they did historically. So 
they put their units, uh, they deployed them this way, um, and now, like, that's great and all, but now they don't have concentrated forces that can be used to attack um, the Chinese. And that's kind of concerning. So where do they put their air force? Uh, do we attack Hebei first or Hubei first? I think we attack Hebei first because that has a resource. Um, we leave Hubei for last. Um, yeah, it's really like, we. oh, you know what? We can't put more than one army in all of these anyway because these are restricted territories. Oh, no. You know what else that means? That means we can't collect the Sichuan resource because we can't trace a line of communication through here. We need to take Hebei and Hubei in order to trace a line of communication into Sichuan. That brings things to a new light. Uh, we're going to leave these back here. Um, the reason we're going to put that one in Shahar is that the Chinese Civil War is going to be inactive anyway thanks to the Soviets uh, sitting in Xinjiang. But... Putting it here at least means we roll one fewer dice on the on the test. Oh, you know what? Where do we want to put it? We want to put it someplace that's going to be a pain to attack. Gansu? But then it's out of supply. Let's keep it in Jahar. That's good for Japan. Okay, they're done. Next out of the cup, the Civil War Resolution. So, as we just mentioned, there's a garrisoned army uh, inside of China, so the Civil War is inactive. So now we resolve uh, expansion. However, uh, you can only expand into territories that are not controlled. But yeah, they could only expand into controlled areas if one side has already won the Civil War. So since the Civil War hasn't ended, it's just currently temporarily inactive they can't expand, period. So Japan has diplomatically, through machinations and puppet governments and payoffs probably, has basically turned these warlord countries against the GMD and the CHICOM so they can't expand into there. Uh, they've backed those countries and the GMD is having some problems. Um, the Soviet Union, by the way, lost their maneuvers cube. I'm sorry, I forgot to update that when they chose to do propaganda earlier. All right, so no civil war resolution this turn. Next out of the cup is the third crisis that puts us in sudden death, and the crisis in question is a 5-1 political crisis. Nazi infighting reduced Germany's effectiveness by one until the end of the turn. Reroll of already in effect. So that is uh, reduced effectiveness Germany. Got to be careful about that one. And next out of the cup is this American Air Force. We're going to put that in the Hawaiian Islands. Oops. I'm going to put that in the Hawaiian Islands. That seems like a decent place for it, just in case there's some kind of attack there. You want some air cover. Next, we've got the fourth crisis, and that ends the turn, ladies and gentlemen. That's been one of the that's one of the fastest turns I've ever had in the pre-war, and it's because it's the first time in a game that I've played where the the fascists decided to play it low and slow, and maybe that'll be to their advantage in this game. We'll see. Certainly, it seems like Japan is doing much better than they have in other games that I have played. So now we have to resolve the uh, French home front. It does not have a stability test because they are still at civilian commitment. The French and British got zero flags that turn. That is insane. That is crazy that the Ger that they were able to resist the temptation to do anything to piss off the French and the British. But what that means is the French are still at civilian commitment. They did not get any new units. They can't build any new units units next turn they're 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 gonna send their resources to waste they're gonna build an offensive or two and do what with it maybe send aid to spain that's the only thing they can do uh with those things next turn okay so the french home front is just move their stuff around and i don't know they do not want to lose the, i mean they got to leave lorraine empty because they have to hold on to provence and they have to hold on to paris they need everything where it is so the french home front is done and there's nothing left for them to do there. Now we just dispose all these things to the tracks. We got some uh, some fortresses for Japan. This is very interesting. I haven't built those fortresses with Japan yet. So the French get a uh, fleet. The Italians get a fleet. There we go. So that's all of those. We flip all of these back over. The uh, Soviets and the Germans get their effectiveness back. 
And nobody increased commitment. That's why we had so few flags. The other thing is that the Soviets usually just increase commitment every turn they can to try to get those extra resources early. But as I mentioned, that can just result in the, in, in the Soviets throwing the game to the Allies. So you have to be very careful at when you choose to do that. If it looks like the Allies are doing poorly, then you increase your commitment to mobilization. That, get, that gets rid of status quo, helps the Allies a little bit, and helps you as well. So that's that's an interesting game that the Soviets have to play there. Okay, that's the end of 1935. And with that, we'll end this video and we'll see you in turn number three.